Good morning, church. We are live and in Acts chapter 2. We're doing part 2 today of the morning Devo and hope you guys are well and hope you guys are doing the the vote thing. I was out on a run this morning and man, I saw a bunch of people at the polls. So it is uh, happening as we speak and uh, it's great uh, to give a reason for the hope that is within us and um, we're going to see today Peter doing such a thing in the book of Acts. And remember we talked about last week, hey Bob, um, remember we talked or la- yesterday about how uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon the uh, early church and and uh, that the book of Acts is really a book of the Acts of um, not just the Apostles, but the Holy Spirit through the work of the Apostles. And the Holy Spirit is um, not a New Testament concept, but if you just open up your Bible to the first page in Genesis chapter 1, you're going to get a bit there of the Holy Spirit as well. And... um, the Bible um, tells us that it was written by the Holy Spirit through separated men of God. And uh, here we see the works of the Holy Spirit being poured out like a fire. And I brought up a passage in Jeremiah um, the other day, and I think it was Jeremiah 20, verse 9, that says, If I say I will not mention God or speak any more in his name, his message becomes a burning, a fire burning in my heart, shut up in my bones, and I become weary of holding it in, and I cannot prevail. That was the prophet Jeremiah saying, man, sharing the words kind of tough because people are coming at me. But he says it's like that fire within them. And here we see that immersion, uh, that coming upon us, if you will, of the Holy Spirit um, in the early church and how it moved them. And how it moves Peter to speak. Now we're gonna let's read it from verse 14, and we're gonna see that when when this really cool experience was happening, uh, Peter was able to explain it by looking at the Bible that he had, and this is something that really will keep all of us on track. It's something we always have to remember that when we have spiritual experiences. We have to be able to line them up with Scripture. If they don't line up with Scripture, then we really need to just say, hey, that was maybe a fleshly thing. Um, And I know that's hard for a lot of people to do on spiritual things um, because they want so badly to think that they're right. But that's how we all are. We all want to think we're right. Um, And uh, that's a form of narcissism because we want to always believe that we are right. And if there's anything the Bible teaches is that we're utterly wrong. Um, If the Bible teaches anything, it's our utter depravity before a holy God. So I am not shocked uh, when I'm wrong um, in the slightest. Um, I would imagine that I would be wrong (laughs) for certain at times, uh, being uh, knowing that the Bible says nothing good in my flesh dwells. And uh, the Bible teaches that no one is righteous before the Lord, and hence why we need atonement for our sins and salvation, and why there is forgiveness. So Peter stands up, right, after this amazing um, speaking of tongues that's going on, people hearing in their own language the works of God, the wonderful works of God. Remember we talked about how some people are going to be amazed by the work of God in you. Some people will be perplexed by the word of God in you. And also some people will mock um, as you go about your your uh, life in Christ. Um, and so expect that amazement, perplexity, and mocking. So Peter stands up. And this is cool. Now we see Mr. Bold Peter. Standing up, right? No longer the guy, the sh- the guy who uh, cowards off to the side. But we see a ton of courage in him. But standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, "And uh, man, may the Lord give us a courage to be able to speak up, right? I love this. He raised his voice. Um, I needed. I, do where's there? Where's is there a place that I need to speak up?" Um, and notice Peter speaks up not on the, the on the so much the politics of his day, but on on 
the um, work of Jesus Christ. Not to say that it's there's not a place for us to speak up on the politics of our day and share our view, but notice that Peter here, his his life changing the life changing event of the resurrection led him to speak up and share about what was happening with this filling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, right? And so it says, uh, the eleven raised his voice and said to them, uh, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what the, was spoken by the prophet Joel. So here we see, he looks at the Bible, and he sees a fulfillment. And it shall come to pass in the last days. You might want to mark that, the last days. We studied the book of Hebrews. We did our devotion there. Remember Hebrews chapter 1? Read that again with this idea of last days. And you'll see that they believed they were in the latter days. And why? Because the first coming of Christ already happened. So after the first coming, coming of Christ, then all that's left is the setting, the second coming of Christ, him setting up his kingdom. And that's really what the Feast of Tabernacles is all about. And, uh, and so like I told you la yesterday that there is a prophetic message in all the feasts as well. We've already done Passover, we've already done Pentecost, and now we're actually looking forward to the second coming of Christ in the time of tabernacle where he sets up his kingdom. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Isn't that great? All flesh, right? Not just some people, not just a certain kind of person, but all flesh. The disciples sure, certainly were a great example of that. And in one sense, not that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, they were, yeah, Jewish, but they were uh, certainly a Montley crew group, um, very colorful, very um, all different backgrounds. And God is going to pour out his spirit on all kinds of people. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. So age doesn't matter. Young men shall see visions. Old men, the old people will sh uh, shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, meaning those who our hired hands, uh, um, so it doesn't matter economically, um, right? Um, there's no uh, economic distinction when it comes to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He will come upon all people, men servants, and all my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs on earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter sees that there is a uh, time after the first coming of Christ um, that is mentioned in the book of Joel that there would be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that there would be, uh, previous to that outpouring, there would be a, um, a, a sign, there would be a, um, a declaration that it was going to happen, which happened. Jesus declared that, uh, and John the Baptist declared, prepared the way for the Messiah, let people know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to be coming. Jesus also prepared his people for this, told them not to leave Jerusalem. Um, but to prepare for this, and that this uh, outpouring then would be um, followed up by the second coming of Christ at some point. We're not told in the book of Joel uh, a timeline so much, other than that pe the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would happen, and there would be signs, and there would be things that would be happening that would lead up to the awesome day of the Lord. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So why don't you call on the name of the Lord, right? What's preventing anybody from calling on the name of the Lord other than wanting to trust someone else or something else? Um, that's what it is. You're going to trust something or someone. It's just who you're going to trust, um, right? So notice Peter, though. What a great example for us this morning of what he does, though. He always looks in the Word of God to find a reason for what is happening. Um, if it doesn't line up, then hmm, it's 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 not good. 
Um, so he quotes from the book of Joel. Very good stuff. And then he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. So these people were very familiar to um, Jesus, um, the historical Jesus. They, they knew of this. They heard of this. They might even saw the work of Christ. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Now this is cool, man, right? Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Jesus being delivered over to the enemies of Christ was not a shocker. It was something that was determined. He was delivered by the determined purpose. God the Father had a purpose and a foreknowledge, it says. And we need to trust God's purpose and his foreknowledge. Um, Jesus trusted in the purpose and the foreknowledge of the Father um, in his life. He trusted God. He prayed, Lord, if there's any, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. He trusts the purpose. And we need to trust the purpose and foreknowledge of God. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. Wow. Wow, that must have shocked them to think that, man, I'm a part of this. <laughs> I'm a part of this um, killing of the Messiah. I have taken by law. You have taken by lawless hands, right? Illegally. It was an illegal trial on Jesus. It was a mock trial. And they have crucified and put him to death. Everything was done in haste. Everything was done not according to proper uh, court etiquette, um, court law. And there were witnesses that were um, heaped up for the purpose of crucifying him. Um, super sad, right? But God had a purpose and a foreknowledge of this. Whom God raised up. Uh, you might want to study who raised up Jesus from the dead. You're going to find some interesting things. Um, it's God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All of them are talked about as raising uh, Jesus up. Um, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, right? Jesus went into death and changed its very nature, right? That's uh, what Epicurus, um, uh, I want to say Epicurus, but um, um, I think I got it wrong there. Um, anyway, there's a good book on the subject on the incarnation. But um, uh, that's what Jesus comes to do. He comes to loosen the pains of death, right? To to no longer to take away death, so death is no longer. Jesus says to his friend, "If you believe in me, you shall never die." Do you believe this, right? And that's always something that we have to kind of answer. Hey, do I believe that um, Jesus has come to loosen the pains of death, right? Um, man, that's a radical statement. Um, take it away, loosen the pains of it, right? It's no longer, um, uh, in a sense, a uh, an end. It is now a birth, right? It's now a coming into our relate our fullness with Christ as we die. To die is gain, the Bible says. It's no longer I that live, Paul said, but it's Christ that live in me. He also says, I have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me. Um, Jesus has come to loose the pains of death, to enter into humanity, into death itself, um, into a b human body, and to meet death face to face within a body to conquer it. And he certainly did. Because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Why? Because of his righteous life. We read that in the book of Hebrews. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. Isn't that cool? Death, he, meaning he's always there eternally. Always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul 
in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made me know the ways of life. You make me full of joy in your presence. Um, awesome. Psalm, you might want to check it out. Psalm 16, I think it is. Um, just a wonderful psalm. Uh, but talking about the eternal life of the Messiah, that the that death would not hold him down. Don't be surprised, everybody that's hearing this. Jesus said he was going to pour out his Holy Spirit. He continues to live. He continues to live now through us. Can't you see that? And can't you see that the Bible even says that, hey, before the Father at his right hand is the Messiah. Jesus is there. Jesus is not dead. He lives forevermore. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. Now, David wrote that psalm, so he says, let me speak to you about him. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing what God, that God had sworn. So David is a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to his flesh, he would raise it up the Christ to sit on his throne. The Messiah would come through the lineage of King David. And it says, he foreseeing this, David foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. So what Psalm 16 about? Well, Peter says it's about the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, which we are all witness, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out on out this which you now see and hear. So he's explaining that, hey, Jesus is now exalted and he's pouring out his Spirit on us. So the living uh, Christ now lives through people. What's the greatest uh, witness of the work of Christ in you? Um, what do you think it is? Uh, tongues? Mm, nope, wrong. It's love, right? Paul says love. The greatest gift is love, right? How do you know you're Christian? The Christian, Jesus said, they will know you by your love for one another. What's your love like? Yeah. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, um, The Lord said to my Lord. Interesting. Peter saw that that psalm, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, had to do with the Father and the Messiah. Therefore, let all the house of Israel assuredly, uh, uh, know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Isn't that beautiful? That the sharing of, of the scriptures cut people to the heart. So it's not so much sharing your own thoughts or your own opinions or things like that and your great philosophies and all that stuff. That's That all has a place, I guess, but... Notice here in the scriptures, Peter just shares the word and people were cut to the heart. There's nothing that <laughs> does a greater job than uh, reaching our inner souls, right, it, than the Bible itself. That's why just reading the Bible and asking God to speak to you can be very powerful experience indeed. And they say to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Have you ever had that encounter where you had someone just say, man, what shall I do? You know, what should I do in light of what you're telling me? You know, that's a great place. And then Peter, what does he say? Repent, change your mind. He says, think, think differently. You know, come away from what you were thinking before and let's move in a different direction. Repent. And therefore, every one of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To the Jew, uh, immersion meant a uh, like a line in the sand. It meant a place of um, departing from the old and coming into the new hope that is to be. 
Um, it's very, very Jeremiah-like, chapter 29, that says, I have given you a, a, a future and a hope. The I, idea of um, baptism, immersion, coming under, um, underneath and immersed in the, the life of Jesus Christ. Um, it is not uh, necessarily a water baptism, right? Um, a lot of times we hear baptism and we think water. That is not what uh, the Bible always is talking about when it's talking about baptism. It's talking about an immersion, a spiritual immersion into, into the life or family of God, into the spirit. We have been immersed in one spirit, um, and uh, we have been immersed into the life of Christ, and, and also the death of Christ. That's why it's no longer us that live, is because we are in Christ. We have been immersed in Christ by faith. So the, the death he experienced, we experience as well. The life he experienced, we experience too. We have become in unified with the Messiah. And so his life is now put on us, and our sins were placed on him in, during the atonement. And... Um, so immersion sometimes uh, is misunderstood quite a bit in um, uh, today's world. So when people say, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, we tend to think that, um, that um, this means you know going to the church and, and dumping them in water. Now they used water as, uh, and there, there's a reason for that, and I'm not going to get into the whole teaching on baptism right now. But, uh, you know, the idea of water, uh, a mikvah, uh, uh, a, if you will, a reservoir of hope, a place, a, a water basin that uh, symbolized the hope of the Messiah uh, would be a good uh, uh, usage, and it is throughout the scriptures, of washing someone, uh, uh, a, presenting someone from one state to another. So dirty to clean, right? Um, unholy to holy. And so that basin of water, which would be called the reservoir of ho hope, the mikvah um, um, in Hebrew, would um, symbolize that, that, that transition from one state to another. And so to the Jewish people, immersion was what they did to show the spiritual aspects of what were going on. Um, so it was a great um, tool. The water was a great tool to use. Um, and so there's much more to be said about immersion, but I just want you to understand that baptism immersion is not a New Testament concept. It is super duper wrapped into the law of God. Everything was immersed in water, and things were also, as we learned in Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews, is that things were immersed in blood, too. So the covenant, the old covenant, was immersed in blood. Um, and then there was also um, priests and utensils and things of that nature that were always being immersed. If someone was defiled, then they would be immersed uh, as a symbol of coming now to be um, uh, ceremonially um, pure. Um, so they can now come before the Lord. So water was another a tool that was used to symbolize um, the purification, the need to be pure, um, the, the need for new identity. So in the New Testament, behold, all things... Um, are new, right? Second Corinthians, what is it, 5, uh, what is it, 21, uh, or, or 19, 18, 19, somewhere in there. But, it, you know, um, um, all things have passed away. All things become new. Woo, that's a baptism verse right there. The immersion, right? All We all have come in to be immersed in Messiah. So that's what he says. Hey, come into the newness, man. And, hey, what's, what's not to love about that? I mean, you know, too many people are focused on just the things of this world. And uh, God, um, you know, you're, we're all going to die, man. It's like, how about we look at that and we go, man, I want something new. I want something eternal. 
and I want something sure um, and uh, historically based. I don't want some fairy tale, that's for sure. And uh, and so you know, repent, change your mind, let every one of you be immersed in the name of Christ. People were immersed in the name of someone, and uh, and so being immersed in the name of Christ, coming underneath Christ. Um, and coming into Christ. That's kind of what that was about. Um, so he is our teacher. And it says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then it says, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. Beautiful passage. And really good things this morning, right? As Peter, you know, we see a boldness in him. Lord, give us a boldness, right? An encouragement. Um, the courage to be able to step forth and to share. And notice that just as Jeremiah in the Old Testament had like a fire in him that needed to come out, Lord, give us that fire of your Holy Spirit to be, to you know, to not be in here, but to come out. We have to share. We're compelled to share about Jesus. And then our experiences, our spiritual experiences need to be explained by the Bible. And this is... Peter looks to the book of Joel and he says, what's happening here in Pentecost is a direct fulfillment of what the prophet Joel already talked about. And so he stuck to the scriptures. And notice that's what he did when he shared. He shared what the Bible teaches. This is what the word says. And we let the word of God hit people where it needs to hit people. Some will be amazed, some will be perplexed, some will mock, and others will, what? Come to the Lord. That's what happens, right? And and Paul says, repent, turn. Turn from your old way of thinking, where you were immersed in whatever else you're immersed in. Some YouTube guy who's telling you what's the truth. Some university that's telling you what's the truth. Everybody's immersed in someone. Everybody has been baptized into something. The question is, what is it? <laughs> you know, is it is it going to help you in this life and in the life to come? And that's what Jesus is our hope. That's why he's our mikvah. He is our reservoir of hope because we are immersed in him because he has the promise not only in this life, but of the life to come. And so that is a greater promise than anything that people can offer on this in this world and so we see those people coming to the Lord as well and it's a promise that's the Holy Spirit's not just for us but it's for our children and for those who are far off that's you and me by the way we're in the Bible right there and as many as the Lord God will call see it's the Lord God's job to call not ours we just share the word And the Lord's the one that brings in the harvest. So you guys have a great one. Wonderful reminders to us today. And we pray the Lord give us great opportunity uh, this week. Okay, you guys take care. Bye-bye.